if there are no other comments or questions to you and Rockstorm, we, we say, say thank you again. And we move on um, in the program. And as you see, um, we will now ask Bill Hare, who is um, a climate scientist um, with 25 years experience in the science impacts and policy responses to climate change and stratospheric ozone depletion. He's a founder and CEO of uh, Climate Analytics, a non-profit company based in, in Berlin. Uh, he's also a visiting scientist in the Earth System Analysis Research Domain 1 at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impacts Research since 2002. And he was the lead author for the, um, the IPCC, which was, as you know, awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in uh, 2007. So welcome to us. Bill Herr, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Margaret. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I, I thank the Global Challenges Foundation for inviting me. Um, I just wanted a personal reflection as well, because in some ways we're sitting here in, the, in this room in the shadow of Professor Bert Berlin, who passed away a few years ago, and uh, Bert had this idea nearly 25 years ago that he should get together the international scientific community and bring governments together with them to agree a common language about the risks of future climate change. And uh, Bert worked uh, long and hard in the IPCC context uh, for many years and very effectively. And one of the things he always uh, tried to remind governments about governments who uh, perhaps didn't want to know much about the problem, such as Saudi Arabia or other uh, fossil fuel intensive economies who tried to always emphasize the uncertainties about climate science. He always gave them a very calm lecture that actually uncertainty is a double-edged sword. That on the one hand, you may get a low outcome, but the real problems lie on the high outcome side of uncertainty. And I know he worked uh, hard in his role as chairman to try and bring out the risks uh, of the, um, from the scientific assessment process, but as we'll see, it's quite difficult for an organisation like the IPCC to do that. Dennis has already referred to a, quite a common definition of risk, probability times consequence, uh, low probability, high consequence events can have a high risk. Science assessments of nearly any kind often focus on the likely range, the so-called 66% range of probability, um, and they do so because governments mandate um, science assessments and usually uh, conservatively don't want exaggeration or alarmism um, because they want to base policy on very solid findings. They don't want to find that uh, next week a paper gets published in Nature that completely contradicts the assessment. So that's an understandable position of politicians and decision makers. But it's also perfectly clear that for certain classes of risks that have already been referred to, the high end of the range is better for policy. These include sea level rise, risks of water, water and food insecurity and so on. They're very important for our policies and actions. Even in our domestic lives, we have house insurance uh, because of the low probability our house gets burnt down or destroyed by some other catastrophe. And the consequences for us personally would be too much uh, if we hadn't insured it. We also, many of us I'm sure, sit in planes every day. This is very much based on a high uh, consequence, low probability outcome. The technology that we sit in has been determined by government reg regulation to ensure that uh, a, a regular public transport aircraft can take off safely even after a catastrophic engine failure, which may only occur in, on an aircraft uh, once in its lifetime at the most. The fact is that present science assessments, as Johannes pointed out, have not yet been able to fully evaluate or quantify uh, these high-end risks. The, bank, uh, the World Bank um, began to become alarmed about uh, the climate change problems that its divisions were facing in the last year or so with a change in management. And they um, became aware that a number of the scientific assessments they were dealing with were not giving them a full picture about the risks that their divisions were already feeling. And they invited uh, John Schoenhuber and I, John, the director of Potsdam Institute, to prepare a series of reports. Um, first one was done uh, last year, uh, turned down the heat, released in November. The second one um, in June, uh, building upon that and focusing on three regions. Um, uh, Southern Africa, or Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. And this had a mandate really to look at 
um, the risks of climate change and not take a totally uh, likely approach to the outcomes that we were examining. We didn't have a mandate to be alarmist, we had to be scientifically rigorous, but we were duty bound to report to the bank the risks that we saw at the higher end of the risk spectrum. And I guess the starting point for any risk assessment is where are we now? Um, and we know that the global warming projections are very much in line with successive uh, generations of IPCC scenarios. But we also know that our sea level rise projections, for example, are not keeping up with the observed rate of sea, of sea level, pointing in some ways to a potentially higher level of sea level rise risk than we are presently able to quantify well with our models. But other risks are also emerging um, that are being observed. Uh, that feed into the risk equation for policymakers. Uh, we're seeing the emergence of more extensive areas of uh, land experiencing heat extremes, 10 times more, in fact, than 40 years ago. We're also seeing significant economic damages emerging in particularly poor developing countries from the high temperatures, part of which is attributed to human activity over the last few decades. We're not certain whether these structural economic damages will persist in the future, because we're not certain how, com how countries will adjust uh, to these, but certainly the evidence is not um, good at this point. We also see that uh, looking at where emissions are headed, um, if you uh, add up all of the uh, pledges and promises that countries are made, and you look at the projections which institutes like the International Energy Agency are making, as well as our own, we see that we're well on a pathway uh, uh, over three degrees warming and possibly approaching four degrees by 2100. With the present uh, pledges, even if they're fully implemented, uh, which seems kind of, uh, quite unlikely, there's about a 20% chance of exceeding uh, four degrees already. If the pledges are not implemented, uh, the chances of reaching four degrees are quite even, actually. We see also a risk of easily of a metre sea level rise by 2100 and uh, that sea level rise would not stop, then it would continue for many centuries following that, rising by a few more metres. We also see in the new uh, scientific literature the risk that in the tropical regions, sea level rise will be significantly higher than the global mean by about 20%. One of the things to bear in mind that when you hear about the risk of um, exceeding four degrees from present emissions, this is based on very solid assessment by a wide range of scientific and policy bodies. Uh, whilst there's a 40% chance on present emission trends of exceeding four degrees, there's also a 10% chance on this same set of emissions of exceeding five degrees, and a non-trivial chance of exceeding six degrees, if you're thinking in um, low probability, high consequence terms. In terms of projected impacts, I think one of the most dramatic things for me, um, seeing what was coming out of the new generation of climate models, um, was the dramatic increase in, in the intensity and frequency of high temperature extremes. One way to look at this is that the coolest summer months uh, in the 2090s, the 2080 to 2100 period, in most continental regions are likely to be substantially hotter than the warmest summer months we have experienced recently. Um, if you begin to think about that, and you begin to think about the heat waves we've had in Europe, uh, that have been experienced in Australia and Russia and the US and begin to think, actually, they will be cool months um, at the end of this century. You can really begin to understand the gravity of the risks that we're facing from these geophysical changes for a four degree world. Now, I know that graphs can be hard to digest. Um, scientists cannot escape showing graphs. They try. But um, uh, this one, um, I think, is very interesting. Um, and I'll just take you through it. The three sigma event um, is a technical term for an unusual heat event today, not unprecedented, unusual. Three standard deviations outside the mean. The lower figure shows five sigma events. Um, these are unprecedented heat events, heat events we don't presently know about, but which could theoretically exist. Then there are two figures here. Uh, the, the two degree world is the RCP 2.6. Um, like any scientific body or whatever, ICP likes it, 
the IPCC likes these acronyms, and this is what it's chosen for these scenarios, RCPs, Reference Concentration Paths. RCP 8.5 is the four-degree world. And you see in the, in the top uh, figure, uh, for unusual heat events, that in the two-degree world, uh, unusual heat events would extend to about a fifth of the planet um, by the middle of the century, whereas in a four-degree world, the RCP 8.5, the black curve, shows the median of these estimates, uh, over half the planet would be experiencing unusual events by the 2050s. If you go down to the unprecedented heat events, events we don't presently know about from our, our experience, the two-degree world actually limits the prevalence of these events to about 5% of the planet by the 2050s. But you see that by the latter part of the century in the four-degree world, more than half the planet is regularly experiencing heat extremes, the likes of which we have never seen before, and these become every other year uh, experiences in summer. Other issues which we identified uh, very strongly was that of ocean acidification combined with warming leading to the regional extinction of entire coral reef systems, uh, not in 100 years but on 20 to 30 year time scales. Likely large scale biodiversity loss, which Johan has already alluded to, leading to dramatic reduction in ecosystem services, both terrestrial and marine. Ocean acidification, uh, we can also call the other carbon dioxide problem after warming, is an inexorable issue. When carbon dioxide is added to the atmosphere, it ultimately dissolves in the surface ocean waters, acidifying them. We're already entering a phase of acidification which appears to be unprecedented in Earth system history, but that we know that when these rates of acidification have occurred, they've been associated with biological catastrophes of uh, biblical dimensions. It will be very hard to slow down and stop uh, ocean acidification. The RCP3PD blue curve is the below two degrees scenario of the IPCC, and you can see that if we were to get onto such an emission pathway, the goal called for by the European Union and many other countries now, um, we would be able to stabilize uh, ocean acidification. If we consider on, continue on the present pathway, the current pledges and beyond, ocean acidification will continue to strengthen and become uh, very, very difficult to reverse. The calculations I show here uh, are based on the assumption that ocean acidification does not penetrate too deeply into the world's oceans. If it does so, uh, we do not know how to reverse it on any meaningful timescale. And ocean acidification is one of those risks you're going to hear more and more about in the future from the scientific community. It is a very, very serious problem. When combined together with warming, it creates major risks for coral reefs. The left-hand uh, side of this graph shows the two-degree world, 2030, 2050, and 2100, for bleaching events for coral reefs. The right-hand side uh, shows uh, similar projections, but for the four-degree world. And you can see that even in the two-degree world, by 2100, uh, coral reefs in the region north of Australia, the so-called coral triangle, are unlikely to be able to exist anymore. And certainly, even by the 2030s, very severe damage would be occurring with bleaching occurring every other year. We simply don't know about the potential for reefs to respond to that. In the four degree world, uh, coral reefs have hardly any chance of survival anywhere. That doesn't exclude uh, reefs, uh, coral reef species migrating to presently temperate uh, ocean climates, but the exi extant and existing coral reefs would no longer be able to grow or exist uh, where they presently are, that is for sure. The uh, other kinds of risks that we looked at for the World Bank, including uh, were to uh, societal systems, um, sea level rise, I'm sure you're aware, is potentially severe for many uh, small island states. Water scarcity and food security globally looks like it's increasingly at risk. When we did the fourth assessment report, uh, we found that actually uh, the potential for a global problem uh, in food security was not high. Uh, we expected food production to increase up to about two to three degrees warming with uncertainty beyond that. 
the new science that's coming in is showing a much greater risk, and I think the Working Group 2 report will have a lot to say about that in March next year. But certainly the literature review that we did and, uh, for the bank shows a significant risk to glo global food security inside a warming of two degrees, and particularly affecting regions. The key findings across the regions we studied uh, for the bank, um, which I haven't already covered, include the expectation of severe water availability problems, which Johan has already referred to, a decline of up to 20% for many regions under a 2 degree C warming, which would create major challenges for already water scarce regions, and up to 50% under a 4 degree warming. Agricultural yield and nutritional quality, essential factors uh, to food security, are projected to decrease in the three regions studied within a 1.5 to 2 degrees warming, with uh, expected negative influences on economic growth and poverty eradication, particularly in uh, southern Africa. The African food security issue, I think, is emerging as quite a problem. Um, for those of you who know a bit about Africa, you, you, you know there's also a view out there that Africa could become the, the breadbasket of the world, uh, and uh, with the introduction of modern technology and farming practices and consolidation, that Africa could have the opportunity to become a major food exporter. And probably that's correct, uh, but if you factor in climate change, you see quite a different picture. Without climate change, as you see here, you have a projected significant increase in food production. Taking into account uh, the most recent generation of climate model projections, which show a warmer and drier environment uh, in Africa than perhaps earlier assessments had found, you see a significant reduction in food availability. And this would feed into substantial uh, shocks um, in uh, rural communities and households, possibly leading into poverty tracks. Um, if, uh, if you get enough of a climate shock and your household income or city income is reduced significantly enough, you are no longer able to generate the capital to rebuild the system. And we already see some examples of this in small island states that have been subjected to repeated uh, tropical hurricanes and droughts where they are unable to recover effectively. And this could become a systemic issue in a number of regions. Regional tipping points. Um, the bank asked us to look at regional tipping points. That is, what are the implications of tipping points in the climate system for development in these regions? Very hard question to answer, um, partly because the science hasn't been done, a major challenge to the scientific community to look more carefully at these problems. But uh, in the three regions that we looked at, we found food production uh, in sub-Saharan Africa was facing a potential tipping point uh, in the region of about one and a half to two degrees warming. Beyond that level of warming, all studies showed, no matter what the assumptions, declines in food yield uh, and capacity, with strong adverse repercussions on food security, feeding into negative economic growth and poverty in the region, particularly when you factored in increased frequency of extreme events like flooding and droughts into these equations. Southeast Asia faced a, a more complex set of combined pressures of sea level rise and degradation of marine uh, ecosystem resources, which of course are not just for food, but for tourism and other activities, uh, leading in the end to higher numbers of people likely to be uh, having to move from their present communities to informal settlements in large, low-lying cities in the region to be affected by a combined set of impacts including heat waves, flooding and disease. South Asia populations very much depend on the stability of the monsoon, disturbances to the monsoon, which we can um, explain physically but can't project adequately, could put our food resources in the region at severe risk. This is combined with other severe risks in the region together, particularly in deltaic regions such as Bangladesh, where you see populations exposed to food security problems, tropical cyclone intensity, sea level rise and heat extremes having uh, highly adverse implications on poverty eradication in the region. Now, turning towards the end of this, I'm looking, I guess, at the more hopeful end of this. This is a, not a happy picture, actually. And, um, but on the other hand, I've already shown you the results that indicate that if we are able to limit warming below 2 degrees, then the worst of the things that I've shown you in the literature uh, can be avoided and, and prevented. Um, so the challenge is to get down to this level. Um, this is a figure which shows um, in the red zone the range of present 
assessment from the scientific community of business as usual emissions, which also tries to account for the effect of present pledges in some way. You see, there is a startlingly high range of warming here, going from just under 4 to close to 6 degrees from business as usual emissions. This is somewhat higher than um, we had assessed, which the IPCC had assessed uh, in earlier times, but is consistent with the present generation of climate models and the present estimates of emissions. It shows that on our present emission trajectories, getting over 5 degrees definitely cannot be excluded, and staying over 4 degrees um, looks like there's a very good chance of that unless we can really significantly reduce emissions. If all the pledges that countries have made were given full effect, then we could limit the warming to something like 3.5 degrees with about a 50% chance. The good side of this is that RCP 2.6, which is the IPCC's lowest scenario in this assessment, is backed by a wide range and increasing number of complex energy and economic system models that show this is economically and technically feasible to do, even starting from our present position. So the, ch the challenges, therefore, are to actually move policy and politicians in this direction. And that's where I think this uh, global risk and opportunity indicator is so important. It's why I was so excited to come here, because we in the scientific community struggle with conveying this very complex information that you've been seeing. It's probably bewildering. I hope I have not used too many acronyms. I know Margaret was going to take that up with me, but... Um, the question is, how can we present these risks to people in a way that they understand? So I, I think that's one of our major challenges, and I think that's why, um, as I pointed out at the beginning of this talk, um, we need to pick up the idea of Bert Berlin about the scientific community really explaining risk and uncertainty to policymakers better. There are very good reasons uh, why uh, the IPCC cannot do this very well. It's a structural reason. The IPCC is an intergovernmental panel on climate change. The governments uh, give the IPCC a mandate and they determine um, the way in which the IPCC is able to report the results from the scientific community. And given that uh, Sweden is not the only government in the IPCC, there are others who want to present a very conservative picture of climate change. So the net result is a consensus that the IPCC in general can only really present the likely case and any effort to get in a high end um, of the risk is resisted strongly. It does happen. I'm about three o'clock this morning some language came in on sea level rise actually um, which puts out a high end of that and was pushed by the US and others. On the other hand, there were other changes made in the text in the early hours of this morning, just a few hours ago, that went the other way. That's the kind of pressure the IPCC is under. The IPCC has great value because it does uh, establish a common language to describe what the scientific community knows about the problem. We cannot do away with it. We should not undermine it. Um, but we should recognise that we do need to go further. And I think what the science shows, as I'm summarising now, is that the failure to reduce emissions leads us into a very high-risk uh, climate territory, point that Johan um, showed very clearly in his presentation, with very high potential for not just ecosystem but societal disruptions. There's a rapidly increasing risk of crossing tipping points. I wish I could show you the work we've been doing on that, but it's, it's very fundamental, I think, to the risk assessment. Um, our knowledge about the precise impacts and risks of high levels of warming is actually very incomplete. I showed you assessments up to four degrees warming. These are about the highest we get in the literature right now. We don't have much more, and in a sense, as physicists, we can't tell you much more apart from our gut feelings, which may not be very helpful. So that's where I'd like to um, leave it. Um, our organisation is really happy to work um, with the Global Challenges Foundation. I think it's a very, very exciting initiative and I'm looking forward to it progressing uh, as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>
uh, interesting um, some interesting results. Um, I have a question for you, and that is, there were two reports presented to the World Bank. So, what does the World Bank do with these reports? What's the follow up? Um, that's a very good question. Actually, um, the the next uh, stage of this work um, is going to be a uh, several products. One is a assessment of three regions not previously covered, Latin America, and the Caribbean, uh, the Middle East, North Africa, uh, Central Asia and Europe, to be done by June next year. Um, the more interesting area of work um, that we will be doing um, is uh, with the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research is looking at um, differential social vulnerability, unpacked as jargon. That means there is, as, as you will have seen from my presentation, the major impacts um, are likely to occur on vulnerable populations and um, sectors of populations, um, young people in regions, women and so on, old people. And this is a, a picture right across um, developed and undeveloped uh, countries or developing countries. And um, we're trying to unpack the relationships between um, social situations, economic situations, and vulnerability and impacts. And that is a research project that we will be doing in the next 18 months or so to try and get at the heart of what I showed you about this risk of poverty traps. Um, the risk of poverty traps is emerging as a serious issue, I, I'm guessing um, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, but there may also be significant problems in South Asia and parts of Southeast Asia. And this is a big uh, challenge to the bank, whose main objective, of course, is poverty eradication. Thank you. Are there questions to, uh, to Mr. Hare? Please raise the hand. Um, again, I, I have I've constantly two complaints about scientists, and they have, um, you know, the use of acronyms or jargon, and they have terrible um, pictures. But uh, uh, since you helped us to analyze and understand them, both of you, you are, you're forgiven for now. <laughs>